thanks for having me, Max, and thanks for letting me talk with you all. It's kind of nerve-wracking having cameras pointing at me. Really? Yeah, because okay. the thing is, like, I can be this this like persona online. Yeah. But in person, I'm not actually like the most famous artist. I'm just this guy. <laughs> but online, I can be whoever I want. Okay. I chose so, to be yeah, the what, most famous. Yeah. I mean, artist. that's what it's all about. How. You know, you came up with a concept, I uh, want to know about that. Because we've been talking about the classes, strategic communications and the arts, culture and media, and you're all that. And so, uh, Maddie and I have gotten together a couple of times. It seems like your favorite place is the Urban Radish uh, in the Arts District. So we meet there. The first time I met him, he had just sold something to the Drake's Bodyguard. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing. So I get to meet Drake's Bodyguard. I would have liked to have met Drake, but meeting his bodyguard is the next best thing. So uh, he's there and he just gave, uh, you know, Maddie a giant roll of money, you know, for whatever he bought from Maddie. And uh, so we, we're sitting down. He says, hey, he says, just go get a bottle of wine, whatever. Uh, you know, and so we got this incredibly highly priced, fabulous bottle of wine. And that's kind of how we got to know each other. And a cheese plate. And a cheese plate. Yeah. Right. Right. OK. So it's fun. All right. So uh, I wanted to just start by saying, uh, Maddie, in this course, we're balancing two great representational systems, art and branding, also known as, as uh, marketing. So, and we're going to get to why you came up with the name, but as someone who calls himself the most famous artist, how do you see these two systems of imagery interacting in today's world, art and marketing? And I just want to say one last thing before you answer, and that is that our little byline that I came up with was a quote from Germaine Greer when she, she said, the art form of the 21st century is marketing. OK, well, first we should probably dissect what we mean by art and what we mean by brand, okay, so that we're all on the same page here. Um, I guess my, re my understanding of art, and I'm not trained formally as an artist. I kind of came into the art world about five years ago, is that it's become a way for uh, culture to, to be communicated. So it's the communication of culture. Art objects allow for moments in time to be preserved and hopefully spread, important moments in time, to be spread throughout the ages and to kind of communicate what was going on at a given moment in time uh, when an artist was alive. And art is often a reaction to the times we're living in. And branding simply put, is a way to sell things in a consumer society. And so if, and we're talking about the intersection of these two things. So if, if we're talking about culture preservation, and then we're talking about like the consumerization of culture preservation, well, then that means we're living in a consumer society. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're living in more of a consumer society than we've ever lived in before. And past notions of what art was and, and what art has, has evolved into um, perhaps found commercialization or consumer culture as like an, a negative thing. Like we weren't supposed to sell our art. We're supposed to express ourselves from our deepest core. Um, what if society is just stupid now and we are just all consumers. We're stuck on our phones, looking at our phones, hoping to get the next little hit of endorphins. Um, that that could be that could be the sad reality of things. Mm -hmm. And so, holding on to what art was, knowing that consumerism and and uh, and capitalism are some of the driving forces behind what art is evolving into leads me as an artist to believe that studying the way brands grow and the way brands are marketed and the way brands fit into a capitalistic society is ultimately a form of education for artists that is absolutely critical to succeed now. The art market itself is a market. And there are capitalistic forces at play. And those, those forces are actually creating a monoculture. And they're actually bad for the uh, creation of culture moving forward. Because if you have to go to art school, to graduate from art school, to get a good gallery, to get into a museum show, 
you have to play by the rules of an institution. And this institution is largely propped up by mega wealthy individuals using the artists as a, a financial instrument. Art at the highest level amongst the billionaire collectors is seen as an asset class. It's either an asset class you invest in, which appreciates over time, and there's plenty of ways to manipulate that market, or it's an asset class you invest in to avoid paying taxes elsewhere. So if, if capitalism at the highest level of the art market is driving what kind of culture is produced and distributed, then we're already at a place where artist is brand. And maybe right. the art institution itself has to be disrupted in order for past notions of cultural production to be reintegrated into the human populace so that we can actually make good art again. Well, you said you just were a Burning Man the other day for four days. Uh, I've never been there, but a lot of my friends have gone and stuff. And what they always say, it is, it's a place where they feel they can be free. They can be who they want to be, whatever, and play whatever games they want to play, et cetera. Uh, so is that like a counterpoint to this uh, in, you know, uh, price tag you know, uh, cultural production you're talking about? I don't know. I mean, would, would you say Burning Man is like a counterpoint? Or is it actually already been sucked into all of this that we're all about already? Well, there's definitely the, the capitalistic and consumer nature of Burning Man. At Burning Man, you can either go and you can be in a tent by yourself and just try to survive. You can't buy anything there, whether you're a super wealthy person or not. But the super wealthy people do fly in on jets, and they have their camp set up, and they have staff working for them, and they have a chef that makes them food. So it's no different than the society we're living in. Why I go to Burning Man is that it's the best example of the infinite potential of human creativity. Because there are no rules, everyone's free to do whatever they want. And when you're able to do whatever you want without thinking about the, the institution or the societal norms we're supposed to fit in, then you can actually push the limits. And so the problem I see with both art and consumerism, we're stuck in like, like we have to package things a certain way to sell them, or we have to we have to make our art a certain way so that it appeals to a customer and it can be sold through a gallery, and we can only produce so much art, or else we oversaturate our market. Um, yeah, I, I think Burning Man is not necessarily isolated from this capitalistic consumerism forces that we are encountering every single day at, at a at a more rapid rate than ever before because we spend more time connected to our phone and our phone is a feed of information and injected into that feed is an ad. Like no matter what, that's how the internet works. And so, so long as a part of our consciousness is being hit with ads, we're going to be kind of almost like subconsciously thinking about consumerism forever. Yeah. And I know you want to talk about advertising. Let me go back to a couple of things about you. Uh, you may or may not know if you haven't you know, looked into, into the most famous artist. He's a Stanford grad. He worked in the, in the tech world, et cetera. And I was struck by two things. First of all, your name. When I first heard about you through a former student, a graduate of this program, uh, she said the most famous artist. And the word famous, and the actually most famous. Because isn't our culture obsessed with celebrity? Isn't it obsessed with fame? Isn't it obsessed with all that? Number one, comment on that. But number two, you earlier said as an artist. And so uh, if you could talk about you know, the, the fame, I, I think we, even if we're not famous ourselves, we are addicted to the, uh, you know, all the stuff that goes with celebrity. Communication technologies has made it such that we're all a little bit famous. We all have a friend that follows us, that likes our stuff that we don't really know. That makes us famous. That makes us, like, we're living out our personal legend and other people are watching that we don't necessarily know. So it's not that we're all obsessed with the Kardashians. It's that communication technologies, which we all have in our pockets every single day, that allow us to do great things and spread information are making us all more susceptible to wanting to share mm -hmm. And in sharing, we're sharing with more people than we actually know. And we're oversharing. We're sharing one to many instead of one to one. And so we're all part of a new system. It's not that we're all obsessed with fame. Now, there is a certain contingent of people, especially millennials, who have grown up just looking at success as being a YouTube star, yeah. wanting to be that. I, I 
was in like freshman year at Stanford when I got my first email, and that's when I got Facebook. And so I, I had this childhood where I wasn't recording everything, and I wasn't constantly obsessed with what my friends were doing. So I'm like right on the cusp. Um, but now kids are growing up, and they're stuck like seeing what their friends are doing, competing with their friends for attention, for, it's, I guess it's not fame, it's just like love, it's attention, it's wanting to fit in. It's like Jeff Kuhn's notion of acceptance. We all wanna be accepted. And yeah. so to be accepted, you have to play by the rules of social media. And so the idea of the most famous is that like, okay, well, if, if you've got to, if, if everyone's goal is to be famous, especially artists, because the more distribution you have, the more work you sell in theory and you're, the more successful you are, which puts you in this camp that art is actually a competition, which I don't necessarily believe. Um, being the most famous, just saying that is provocative enough to elicit a response. It does elicit a response. I remember in the New York Times, you know, when he did the pink house that's here, uh, you know, and, and they did the story, you know, they, they talked about it as a concept that you came up with. But it did get attention. You know? And, and yeah. so the mo most famous, yeah, sure. I, I, I just wanted to be provocative. I guess that's what you have to do. If I've got to play the game, I've got to play it right. And so that was the provocative angle. And so as far as artist is concerned, I myself, am, I'm a capitalist, right? Like I, want, I, I made my money helping people sell things on the internet to people who didn't necessarily need those things. But I use psychology and calls to action and targeting and imagery to sell things to people. And so I got to thinking about what's the best product to sell on the internet. And it's a highly visual product. It's a product that has a bunch of, of context embedded into a given image. It's something that spreads. And it's something that doesn't necessarily have, um, it, it, it's a commodity, but it's not something that has a natural uh, like price ceiling. With art, I could sell you this full, this notebook at $14 or $14 million. It's just about what story I tell related to it. So as a marketer, art became the perfect product to sell online. It was like, okay, I can sell, a flea, I could go to a flea market, buy a painting for $20, tell everyone I bought it for $20, put some kind of contemporary theme on it, tell the story of signing it as the most famous artist and look at me, I'm so great, and all of a sudden it's worth 1000 that's an incredible product. That's a huge margin. And then people share the photo of the product they just purchased, which then gets me more customers. So it has this viral coefficient built in the product itself. So it's not so much that, was, so there, those are the two main components of the premise. It's like okay. everyone is now forced to share. We're all in this economy. And I wanted to find a product that worked really well. And what I've learned through art as I've, I've gotten deeper into it is the institutions that have been built around art are actually in place to preserve culture. And so if what I'm doing is actually a great representation of our time and our culture, then the institution will preserve it and I'll be a legend. How cool is that? I'll actually become the most famous artist. And so that's the that's, that's the, the premise. Yeah. That's the premise. Okay, that's very good. I mean, after when we first met that night and we just split a bottle of wine, uh, I walk uh, Maddie to his, uh, he, has a, he has a really interesting, you know, it, uh, Mercedes van, I guess. It's, yeah. And so he had a painting that he picked up at, I guess, a swap meet or something. Yeah. And it was, you know, one of those paintings you see at swap meets. But he, because of this, he had painted the, the river that was flowing through it pink. So then he signs it and everything like that, and he said exactly what he just said now. He says, now you can go and sell this painting for a few thousand dollars, whereas I don't know how much you paid for it at Swap Me, you know, but. 20 bucks. 20 bucks, so there it is. And I'll show it to you later, uh, you know, but it actually, I had it in my house, and uh, my neighbor is probably the number one representative of photographers in, in the country, and has, she has a great eye, she's an art center grad, all kinds of stuff. She's walking through the house and she sees that. She goes, I love that. And <laughs> I mean, she loved it. She, and I'll show it to you and you can decide what you think. So I thought that was very interesting. You made art out of something that was, you know, throwaway. And then somebody whose uh, taste I respect said, I love that. Well, so it's funny because I didn't actually come up with that concept. None of the concepts that I'm marketing or selling are necessarily mine. They're things I find on the internet. The internet has become one big Xerox machine. If you think about how the news breaks a story, some, some like uh, 
some journalist breaks a story, then the news and the news organizations around the globe just regurgitate that story, and it becomes a t like a competition to write the best headline and put the best image inside of this little story that's going to spread throughout Facebook. And so, my way of thinking about art is well, lots of great art has already been created. Why not? use data to figure out what is actually selling and then emulate that style. Because you can't, you can't copyright a style. You can't trademark a style. You can say, yeah, I, I was the first person to ever do a three-layer screen print. But a, and, and Warhol was. But then millions of people have done something similar. And their art still sells because we as like a species like familiarity. We do, yeah. We like familiarity. So like the, the woman who saw this painting probably has seen something else like it in the past. And I was just tapping into something familiar to her. Uh -huh. And so, you know, that's, that's another big takeaway about the time we're living in. And it's like all these brands are copying each other. It's all like fashion week. It's like, all right, so it's all polka dots this time. And then we're all going to get into tie dye. And then we're all going to go black. Like we're all going to. You know, it's stripes now. It's like this big monoculture machine. And so I guess I'm just referencing that. It's not like I'm some genius. I'm just like copying what already works. Yeah, speaking of that, you, last time we got together, you were saying about the algorithm that you developed. Can you talk about that? The algorithm I developed. Which one was I that? Mean, you said oh, well, uh, so. I mean, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to hear about this. Yeah. Well, the. And did you actually take, develop I'll it? A, or, I'll take a step you, back. You so, down. okay, I'm the most famous artist. People go, okay, who are you? I go, I'm the most famous artist. They're like, what does that mean? I go, well, I make art that makes me more famous. And they're like, okay, can you give me an example? And the response is always like, well, I start with a headline. I think of an art project, and really anything can be art now. I mean, Duchamp and the Dadaists and the Situationalists kind of all made it such that you could put a toilet in a museum, and so long as you can defend it, it's art. So as the most famous artist, I go out and I try to figure out, OK, what's my headline? What's a provocative headline? Artist paints a series of houses slated for demolition pink in a Los Angeles neighborhood and pisses off the neighbors. That's a headline. Artist drags around a million dollars in a duffel bag at an art fair and shows just how shallow the art world is. That's a headline. And so. I got thinking about like, okay, what are headlines that are coming? What are, what's like, what are we anticipating? Okay, Trump getting elected, that's a headline. Maybe I can make art about that, but I don't really want to touch politics. Um, and so AI, artificial intelligence, is something that's coming. It's going to automate us all out of jobs, and everyone's afraid of it. And so as an artist, I got to thinking, okay, so what's my headline? And so I found some coders at Stanford that I went to school with, and I said, guys, we got to build an artificial intelligence that makes art so that I can get a headline around this. And you know, within three months, we had built this like simple version of an artificial intelligence that could take an image, like I take a photo of this class, and then I take a style, like I take a style of, of um, Picasso, and I feed the Picasso imagery into the machine, and then take the image of the class, and then the algorithm kind of figures out what the brush stroke width is and what the coloration should be, and then ultimately creates an image of this class in the style of Picasso. And so it's a simple like open source thing developed by folks at Stanford and MIT, and it's called Style Transfer. But I was able to spin up this story that I created, the first proprietary artificial intelligence. And I did a show at a gallery where I, I, I used the faces of portraits of people who were effect, effectively going to be automated out of jobs, everyone from Mark Zuckerberg to a taxi driver. And I use the style of Chuck Close. And Chuck Close is this artist who had a debilitating accident. And so he was forced to paint in this very peculiar way, which kind of was like almost pixel. He painted pixel by pixel, but there were larger pixels. And so this, this algorithm transferred Chuck Close's style onto all of these portraits of high, high class and low class individuals. And the, the cohesive story that I told the press is I used a style of an artist, so I nodded to the past. I, I kind of contextualized my whole project in the art world uh, to tell the story of humanity all being automated out of jobs. And I used an AI to do it. And that became a headline. 
And so it's not so much about the actual writing of the code, it was about creating the headline so that when you Google artists use AI, you find who? The most famous artist. Because at the end of the day, the way people are finding things are through their friends sharing something, so you gotta make something that's awesome and shareable, or via a search. And so if you can think about, as an artist, what are people searching for, particularly people that I'd like to make my customers, and then you make an art project around that. Like this pink house project, it was, I wanted property developers to work with me. I'm building a whole, a whole series of businesses along the supply chain for artists, and one such business is an agency that helps mural artists partner with property developers to paint murals on behalf of brands, so they create Instagrammable experiences. And it sounds like really dumb, but it, there's like, tons of money going into that. And so one way to validate myself with property developers was to get Curbed LA and a few of the other uh, influential trade magazines within the property developer sphere to write about a project. So we made the pink houses. I, I lost my train of thought. Where no, no, yeah, your train of thought's <laughs> great because the reason that I wanted you to come to the class, this is a class about marketing and the arts, is because you are such a good marketer and an artist. I mean, you really like exemplify the, to me, the moment. And it's exactly what you're saying. I want the headline. I'm gonna get the headline. You think of a way of getting the headline because that's how you're going to make a living. As well as, you know, get, get uh, some kind of notoriety. I'm not a good artist yet. And, I'm, and that's why I'm not the, great art, the greatest artist. I'm the most famous artist because that's what I'm good at. I'm good at marketing. You and are. So, and so yeah. like, with time, maybe I'll get good at painting. But I guess, I, I guess the question is, does it even matter anymore? I don't think it matters, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I was saying, because, you know, I, when I was got found the Jermaine Greer quote, it was in one of the articles that we're doing for this class, and she was writing about uh, putting down Robert Hughes, the you know, old-fashioned type of art critic, writing about Damien Hirst, and she said the fact that he could write what he wrote about some insight about death, he, uh, Damien Hirst won the game, and, but it was all about branding. You know, that's what he was doing. He was marketing. He's a great marketer. You're a great marketer. And, and that's where we're at today. And so if the, all of these folks here in this room, these students, they're going to go out into the world, in the art world in some way or other, and they're going to have to deal with marketing. My whole point is, that, you know, the director of our program is a guy named Jonathan. I said to Jonathan, I said, I, said, I don't care who they are, what they're doing. If you run a gallery, if you don't know marketing, you, you can't. You can't be a successful gallery. You can't be a successful museum director, any of it. So marketing's key. So let me ask you this. The, the uh, marketing is about image management. So how do you manage your image as the most famous artist? Is there like a, a, is a process that you go through in managing the image? Well, I kind of stumbled into the most famous artist because I was filmed stumbling around drunk and naked on a beach in India throwing cash in the air at the end of my tech career. And my tech career ended that day. Um, if you can laugh, it's funny. Um, well, it wasn't funny, probably. It, it, was, it sucked. Oh, my gosh. Um, but. So my image as the most famous artist is I just don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want to get the headlines, and I just don't care about art. And that, in and of itself, makes people cringe, but it also makes them wonder why. And so... I guess the best advice I can give around image management is that mystery matters. Um, yeah. Mystery matters. I think, I think an artist, as soon as they try to write what their mission statement is, like I've, I'm trying to apply to go to Yale for my MFA, and I've had to think about what I'm going to write in my 500 word essay. And I think as soon as I actually write 500 words about what my practice is, I I like lose my practice because I compartmentalize myself. Like I've heard everyone say, like if everyone's out of the box, get back in the box. Like I'm, I'm afraid to get in the box. Um, so image management. Look, if if you want to be the best barber in the world, call yourself the best barber in the world. You're, we're at a time where that's actually possible. Um, if you Maybe a better question. I'm sorry that that's not, I can't answer that question. What do you mean image management? Like, yeah, I wear the same costume every day and I drive around a or white even Sprinter call it a van costume. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I make sure that I'm seen with really beautiful women and all the right people. And I that's share, I share yeah. pictures of like my vacations. Yeah. Like we all do. We all live in this like success theater. And the only way to actually make people think 
you're a certain thing is to create the perception that you're that thing. And so, like, if, if I just posted pictures of a dirty apartment and, and uh, like, food piling up in the, the, the sink, people would think I'm a slob. So I don't post those pictures. And so we're all consciously thinking about how we're curating people's perception of who we are. And I guess the thing is, perception, if crafted masterfully, becomes a reality. Like, I, I'm pretending to be the most famous artist, and I'm kind of actually becoming it. This, this guy, Stefan Simkowitz, who maybe you know, he's an art dealer, he invited me to an art opening of Zachary Armstrong at Evergold Projects last weekend as his guest and introduced me to everyone as the most famous artist. So if, and introduced me to people that work at Sotheby's and billionaire collectors. And so if that isn't managing your image to the point where people start to believe it, then I don't know what is. And it's just like a singular focus. It's like, I'm this. I'm the most, and like, not everyone can be the most famous artist. You could say, I'm John Smith and I'm a fantastic sculptor, you know? But okay, then show us your fantastic sculptures. Um, I guess what it means is that like you can, you, you don't have to, you don't have to lead with like, I'm an artist. You can lead with this abstraction of like, this is what I am, I'm this very spiritual person. And you'll attract an audience of people or in a community of people that are interested in spirituality. And then you better figure out how to sell some shit to them so you can make a living and you be their guru and then you've got yourself a cult. Um, we're all kind of creating our own cults right now. Yeah. No. No, that's a, that's a good answer. You just talked about, you know, managing your image, which is all about uh, marketing. Branding is also about making emotional connections. Is that part important to you? You know, because we have to connect with our customers. I talk about the customer journey, the CX, all that stuff. And, and particularly, uh, I think it's about the experience. But is it, and it has to be, have an emotional touchstone. Is that matter to you? Absolutely. I'm, from the start, from my startup days, you have to make your customer happy, but you also have to have a plan for how to react to the press, or how to react to your haters, or how to react to like your friends. Like you cut you. Like I've found myself sucked up so much into this world of the most famous artist. That I've like kind of lost touch with reality, and it takes a, like a grounding moment, like burn, Burning Man, every once in a while to to kind of get to the core of it. Um, okay, for example, like people write, "Your art sucks," or "You copied this person," or um, you know, all sorts of mean things. And I guess my immediate reaction, rather than blocking them like Donald Trump would do, I write back like smiley face, ha ha. <laughs> and you know, like if you start a dialogue with kindness you can eventually convert someone who doesn't like you in the beginning to becoming a fan. And so that's one category of people that I have to interact with. So it's almost like developing a talk track. So like when I reach out to a building owner, I have pre-written emails that are essentially all of my FAQs and uh, my intro and all this stuff. And I just kind of like hammer through this almost like robotic communication track which I've optimized to get the job done. And so that also applies to the customer experience. When someone sells something, I screen grab their transaction and I post it on my story and I tag them and they get this like little feeling of awesomeness, like they got acknowledged for being part of the journey and they might get a few followers from that. And so ultimately the people who pay your bills and the people who are even willing to engage with you, whether positive or negative, all deserve your attention. There's this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's like an excellent marketer and he was actually an investor in my business, which ended up failing, my last business, which ended up failing, where I um, stumbled around drunk and naked on a beach. And he is like, he responds to everyone on Twitter. He's got like a million and a half followers, and he responds to everyone. And I think that that idea that he's available, and whether it's not it's him, it might be like one of his interns or something like that, it creates this emotional connection with the customer where they're willing to stand up for you. They're willing to retweet your stuff. They're willing to become your, like, your audience of activists. And so right now, we're like, I feel, I was at the laundromat two days ago, because I'm living this super weird life where I'm traveling from project to project to project all over the world, and I basically have a suitcase, and I wash it at a laundromat or at a friend's house, but I happened to be at a laundromat because it was very dusty from Burning Man. And I thought about it, and I was like, I'm alone in a room full of strangers airing out my dirty laundry. 
And that's like a great metaphor for life. Like we're all alone. Media. We're all alone in a room full of strangers. We're like we're surrounded by everyone we know. And they're willing to like like the stuff we post if it if it like fits within a certain kind of category of content. But if you don't follow that, then you're alone. And so they're effectively strangers. All these these like digital personas are strangers. And as soon as you start airing out like what's actually going on in your life, everyone's turned off. And so I guess like I guess we're all kind of living an inauthentic life to a certain degree. Like we're all sharing just the best moments. And so as an artist, I guess it's my job to explore that idea that everyone's living in an authentic life. So being as, uh, as inauthentic as possible, calling myself the most famous artist when I had like zero followers and then be, like slowly becoming it, I guess is a representation of that. Yeah. Well, it, you know, you, you say you're not an artist like in the classic sense of being able to be a painter, but you are a conceptual artist, no different than Duchamp, that one book you, you, know, you, you sent me, thank you. And so, you know, a conceptual artist is, an, is as much of an artist as somebody who paints really beautifully. It's just a different type of art. Well, a conceptual artist tries to engage the cerebral cortex instead of yeah. the retina. Um, but, you know, like, there's something to be said about making beautiful stuff. Like, I go to art galleries and I, I love art. Like, if I had more money, I would be buying beautiful art from people. I don't necessarily know that I'd buy it through the gallery institution or at Sotheby's. I'd buy it directly from the artist so that the money goes into their pockets so they can keep creating awesome stuff. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm a, I just got back from Burning Man. You got to excuse my lapses and like talk track. <laughs> Is uh, this interesting at all? Are you okay? All right. Yeah, they're paying attention. I can tell. <laughs> you know. Uh, the one thing I would say is that there is like an intertextual quality among brands. Brands talk to each other. And in this, I don't know if, how many of you read the story, you know, the artist and brand culture, the article for this week, but you know, where Andy Warhol talks about Coke and says that Coke is always the same, you know, et cetera. He's a brand talking about a really, another brand. They're both big brands. And so I want to ask you, you know, Maddie, how do you talk or interact with other artists or other artist brands? That's a good, that's a really good point, um, or a really good topic. Uh, so brands at Black Friday, like REI did the better out than in campaign, where they kind of said, okay, we, we don't want to sell everyone things. We'd rather our customers go out and participate in outdoor activities, like forget Black Friday. And they were celebrated for that by the media. And so that was a response to their competitors. They were like, kind of like, playing off I their competitors' that, yeah. kind of direction. So what that does, what that symbolizes for me as an artist is I've got to have a dialogue with other artists in order to be relevant. And in order to be as relevant as possible, I need to be poking the biggest bears possible. Mm -hmm. And so my first major mural was a big polka dot mural, very close reference to Damien Hirst spot paintings all because I wanted Damien Hurst to see it. And I have done things to poke Jeff Koons and have done things to poke Takashi Murakami and have done things to poke uh, pretty much everyone. So the general idea is, yeah, you can, you can use artists to, as references or you can use artists to create a new dialogue about the importance of that artist. So like, there's the familiarity thing where like I make a painting that looks like Warhol. There's this artist, Knowledge Bennett, and he does screen prints, but instead of using Marilyn, he's using Tupac or he's using Kate Moss. Mm -hmm. And Banksy has done this with, with uh, Warhol's work as well. Um, I think that's interesting. That's the, that gets you the familiarity sale. Um, but there's a way to perhaps like interrogate the importance of the artist. Interrogate like whether or not they're actually skilled in what they're doing. Like if I can recreate the work that is supposedly a master and then throw a bucket of paint at it, does that make everyone feel something different about that artist or the, the val validity of their art? Um, or if I could like, like I would love, I would love to buy a Picasso and then burn it. I mean, call me crazy, 
but that would freak a bunch of people out. That would freak a bunch of people out. And that wouldn't be Now, would you me. hold like a ceremony? Oh, yeah. Something? It would be yeah, like okay. live streamed yeah. and yeah. invite all the influencers. You probably could find somebody who could buy it for you and you guys can burn it and get it. Yeah. But that's not, that's not like, that's not referencing Picasso. That's like something else. That's violent. It's, it seems violent to me. But violent? I mean, it, 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 Is it violent? To, Is to, it? to burn a, a work of art? Yeah, there's, there's and it's, I'm not, but I'm we're, not all, judging it. we're all like, dust in the end. Like, oh, I know. Why we're all we dust to in like the end. worship these artifacts. Yeah. I have a couple more questions because, like, if, if we're all inauthentic and we're all just striving to create our most famous self on these platforms that themselves are we're, their businesses, we're not striving. We have to be cognizant of the fact that it's happening. It's happening. And we can yeah. ignore it. We can just yeah. isolate ourselves and live. And darkness, which is totally cool. I like my goal is to, to make enough money to buy a farm to never have to deal with anyone ever again. Yeah. Okay. And it's ironic that I have to become the most famous artist to do that. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Please. No, no, no. Yeah, this is fine. No, no. This is, I, well, I'm interviewing you. Okay. But I have just two more questions. Like, so, so is there is there from your view as an artist? And I do see you as an artist. I, but you are also a brand. And you are a person who is very upfront about that. I do like that, that you're honest about it. You don't say, I'm an artist. You just say, look, I need to have a customer. I need to make a sale. How am I going to make money, et cetera? We've talked about this. But uh, there's this, you talked earlier about art is a cultural reference system. So like, this is where art is today. This is where social media, marketing, advertising, all of this is today. We're like swimming in it, you know, drowning in it perhaps. Uh, do you see art having a future? So, yeah, so I have I have a vision of art, okay? So I imagine I'm in a warehouse and I've got a data feed of all the most popular art objects selling and that's my aesthetic trend reference and I have all of the most popular culture images getting fed into this system and I've got my algorithm running to make highly saleable and highly shareable art objects and then I've got robots in an assembly line just painting these things for me. So copying people's styles and applying contemporary themes to those styles, yeah. contemporary imagery to those styles. And so that becomes this really rational um, art world that eliminates a lot of the crap. Because a lot of art can be reproduced. A lot of it isn't necessarily pushing the boundaries. And then there's this other human cultural production sphere over here. And that's the stuff the robots can't create. Mm -hmm. And that's the art that ought to be celebrated in the future. What's an example of that? I don't think we've seen it yet. We haven't seen it, okay. I mean, some stuff can't be copied by a robot yet. It just can't. So that kind of stuff should exist within the art institution and should be celebrated. And the rest of this stuff will be sold in an Ikea fashion, where you just like close your eyes and then based on your dreams, you get a painting on your wall that's 3D printed. Creativity is the only thing that separates us from machines. And so we better focus in on get an extra creative because this like haphazard shit that is being produced out of art school that then enters a gallery ecosystem where a gallerist is incentivized to sell it and push it up the chain so they can make more money to buy another house in the Hamptons doesn't actually encapsulate, well, it does encapsulate culture, but it doesn't encapsulate a forward-looking, collectively conscious culture. And so that's, that's like a future that I see. Hope gets my name, but what's puzzling